the first speaker, you can see Dr. Julian Davis, that's myself. I'm the principal of Abbey College here in Cambridge. Uh, my school is behind me in the photo. I'm joined by Liz Elam, who's the principal of Abbey College Manchester. Um, we are going to give you some information this morning about how you may enter a UK medical school. Now, on this call, amongst our group this morning, there are people from the world, but people um, who are current students in our colleges. We have students who are looking to join us and will be joining one of our three colleges in September. Um, we have students who are interested in finding out more. And we've also got other people such as agents. So welcome to you all to this talk. Um, I can see I still have people looking to join. I'm just going to help to admit a few more. Sorry about that. There we go. So there we are. We have 45 of us right now. Great. Okay. So I'm now going to move the slides on. So hopefully you will see the slide view. There we go. So you should see the contents page now. There will be a delay when the slides move. But I won't move them very quickly. So this is what we're going to talk about, Liz and myself. So we're going to introduce our, uh, our colleges. I've already mentioned um, who we are. And I thought I would tell you the routes to becoming a doctor, because for many people who are joining us this morning, that's your ambition, is, is you actually want to become a doctor. How do you do that in the UK system? Then, what do we do in colleges like the one behind me? What do we do in Abbey Cambridge, in DLD and in Manchester to help students, um, who are international particularly, help you become doctors? And then finally, well, how has it, it worked out for us? How many students have gone to medical school? So we'll, we'll just have a, a quick look at last year, just so we can see the kind of medical school international students go to in Liz's college and my college. Okay, so as I've mentioned, for those who joined at the very uh, early part of this call, those who are just joining, that first speaker there, Abbey College Cambridge principal is myself, Julian Davis, and uh, Liz will speak um, in a few minutes, so you'll, uh, you'll see the principal of Abbey in Manchester. We are part of a group, and this group has helped many students to enter medical school. We have created a lot of support for medical students and I'm going to talk a lot about that because that's quite important. So to set the scene, as I'm sure you have been told, entering medical school is hard. There are fewer places than students who want to join. Okay, so before we carry on, I'm just going to one quick, there we go, I'm just helping out so I'm muting some people. Great. Here we are then. So I'm speaking to you as the principal of the college on the top left of the picture. Liz is the principal of the college on the right, and that's our sister college down there in London. You can see in a very central location. So this group, we are specialists in international education and sixth form education. Okay, so that's a very quick introduction to who we are, what we do. We help international students go to universities in the UK. Let's now focus on the detail about how, you, how do you become a doctor? All right, so this is the UK system. So I'm gonna take you through what happens before university, what happens at university and what happens after, just so you have an understanding of the process. Okay, I can see people are still joining and that's fantastic. So I'm just going to admit one or two more people. For those who have just, just joined, welcome. And you can hopefully see my name, I'm Julian Davis. So we're on, we're on stage two now, which is how do you become a doctor? So pre-university. So in other words, this is what you do in school or high school. This is crucial because the route you take in high school determines your success at getting into medical school. Now you can see there, there are only two routes that we offer in our colleges for you to get to medical school. Okay, just gonna, there we are, mute some audio. Okay, you can either do A-levels or 
International Foundation Programme. There are other programmes that some students do in the UK. Pre-U is one, it's a very small number of students do those, a very small number of schools, and IB. Again, in the UK, not very common, but it is a route you can do. We've decided to focus on the main routes in the UK. The main route for medical school is A-level. I'll talk to you in a little bit more detail about A-level. You probably already know this, but it is the standard entry route for British students. And most international students follow the same route. You have to get top grades. Three A's is a standard offer. And you may imagine for some of the very top universities like Cambridge or Imperial, it could be a little higher, perhaps an A star and two A's. We've also created our own pre-university medical courses which is an international foundation program. So that's what that is. It's an alternative to A-level. Liz is gonna tell you uh, the detail of our international foundation programs, but the word our is important. We've created those for people like you, for international students as an alternative. Okay, now let's assume you have, you've taken one of those two courses, you're heading towards getting the, those grades, those fantastic A's and the 70 plus percent. You've got good English, you can see there's an IELTS requirement, and you may understand why it's 7.5, which is quite high, because as a doctor, you will be talking to British patients in British hospitals, and in most medical schools, you'll be doing that very early in your course. So you have to have uh, advanced levels of English. You then get to medical school. Let me just move the slide. There we are. University. Um, so, of course, most university courses last for three years. A medical course will last for five or six, depending on the university. Once you qualify, you then continue your training. And this is important. This is a different process for qualifying than, than becoming an engineer or perhaps becoming a mathematician. You do your undergraduate, but you're not finished. You then have to continue your training. You spend two years training and you might perhaps as a broad term call yourself a junior doctor at this point it's called foundation years you do this in the uk you may choose to return home but the vast majority of students carry on you work as a junior doctor for two years in the uk perhaps you would move to different parts of the country okay for the different stages then you will choose to specialize you don't stay a junior doctor for the rest of your career. You take one of two branches. You either become what we call a GP or a general practitioner. That takes three more years of training. Or you become a specialist in an area of medicine. Rather than general practitioner, you become a specialist, which we call a consultant. You might become a consultant in a particular area of medicine, such as cancer, perhaps, or child medicine, or, or skin or kidney medicine. So you could be an oncologist or a pediatrician, and so on. That's a longer process because you are becoming, if you like, one of the elite practitioners in a hospital. Um, could be five to eight years. That's the full process to become a qualified doctor. Now, one of the questions I'm often asked is, how do I go through this process as an international student and as an international uh, doctor, eventually, when you reach the end of your first stage at university? So let's talk quickly about visas. So to get to a school like Liz's in Manchester or our colleague in London or, in fact, the school behind me in Cambridge, you need to be sponsored by us. Um, and we're very happy to do this and we have permission. We are highly trusted sponsors of international students. And that sponsorship is a familiar one to many of us called Tier 4. Most uh, students uh, start their courses as Tier 4 child, slightly older children are Tier 4 general. So it's a bit of a technical issue, but one we're very familiar with. And all of our students get sponsored because we have a very robust process of admission into the college to make sure that when you apply for the visa, we have the correct supporting documents for you. So there, there usually aren't any uh, obstacles in obtaining the permission to study for the pre-university. If you are then successful getting to university, you then move to another stage in the same category of visa. For the slightly older student, you're considered tier four general. 
And again, if you have a place at medical school and you have the funding, getting the sponsorship for the visa is a technical matter. In other words, it's, it's relatively straightforward. So there's, there's usually no problems in you progressing to university for the full duration of study. So you then may choose to go home to continue your training at home, and that is something people do. Most students stay in the UK for their foundation year. This is when it gets a bit more interesting, perhaps, because you're still a student, because you're still a tier four student uh, visa, but you are now employed. So big sigh of relief, you start earning money as a junior doctor. Um, that's going to be extremely helpful for you. Uh, the salary starts at around about £30,000 uh, UK. Um, very helpful for you to obviously start to part fund your life now. Um, so there we are. You, you will get the, the, uh, the tier four general because, well, what the UK government don't like to say very often is they want you to come and train here. They want you to be a doctor. We have a shortage of doctors in the UK. There are shortages of doctors in many, many countries, not just because of the current situation, but generally. So the UK government is actually very keen for you to stay and do your foundation training and spend two years in our hospitals in the UK. And we'll pay you for that. But the government wants you to do that. So it's, it's a process that you will transition through um, with ease if you choose to. Moving on, if you, can, if you decide to continue your training and specialise as either a general practitioner or a consultant, the UK government says, yes, please stay. Stay in the UK. We want to train you on that. Please keep working in our hospitals. We want you to stay. We will pay you. And you are now employed and your visa is tier two. So the message is, for doctors, we want doctors in the UK. We want you to come, we want you to study and train in our schools and in our hospitals. So the visa process may seem daunting and may seem uh, a hurdle, may seem a barrier, but it really isn't. It's not something I would worry about because we will help you at the very start of that first visa, tier four child. We are highly trusted sponsors. And once you're in the system, once you're on the route to becoming a doctor, the UK government want you to stay. They'd be delighted for you to stay. So transitioning through is a formality. Okay, so that's, if you like, the, the structure of how you will progress through in your early stages of your career. Pre-university, perhaps at one of our schools, university, foundation, specialism. Okay, what do we do? Well, this is something um, that, will, that, that will feature for the next part of the talk. How do we help students uh, in that first part of the journey? How do, what, what do we do to help you in that pre-university to get into the medical school, to get that offer? At this point, I'd remind you that there is no guarantee. There are fewer medical places at university than there are people that want them. So there is therefore competition. And what happens with competition is the universities will decide which the ones they want. They select. So when there's competition, you get selection. Selection means there are selective categories. So they will say, well, we want students with A-levels, three A's. I've mentioned this already. We want students with IELTS, 7.5. We also want students that we think will be very good doctors. So we're going to test you. We're going to interview you. We will expect a very high quality in your personal statement. This is where we come in. This is our expertise. And as you can see from the slide, Liz's college in Manchester and my college, we were actually founded to help students get into medical school. So this is, this is what we existed for. Um, for my school, it was just over 25 years ago. For Liz's, it's uh, just under 30 years ago. That is why we were founded. Since that time, our college has, it, has have both evolved and grown. We, you can see behind that's, that's just part of my school now. There are over 450 students studying for many different disciplines, but medicine is still a core component of what we do and what we are for. Our sister school in London, DLD, was actually founded many, many years ago in 1931 and has a broader range of disciplines but there's a core of medicine going through that school every year, the same as for Manchester and Cambridge. So it's, it's a specialism for us. Um, 
a specialism that we don't do not take for granted we are always reviewing we're always thinking how can we improve how can we make a better service and how can we help people like you get to medical school okay so that's a little bit about the career how you get through how we fit in for the pre-u let's look at the two different pre-u routes so the traditional route as i've mentioned is a level now, A-level um, stands for advanced level. It's the standard qualification that students in this country sit at the age of 18 or 19. So there are many children that do A-levels and colleges like Liz's and mine, we are sometimes called A-level colleges because that's a lot of what sixth forms offer is A-level. So if you like the traditional route, you must do three subjects. So this is quite an un unusual system in the UK. You do not do many subjects at A-level. You don't do five or seven or nine. You do three. We like children to start with four and perhaps then decide which three to carry on and which one to stop. So three A-level is all that is required. It does mean, because it's only three subjects, the depth is quite substantial. You will find out a lot about science when you study an A-level subject. Rightly so. It's a good qualification. I'm also asked many, many times, which combination of subjects should I study if I wanted to study law or engineering or English literature or, or, or um, um, physics, perhaps. For medicine, though, it's really very easy for me to advise because the medical schools really want you to have a strong background in science because of course you will study the science of human physiology, human anatomy, human pathologies. So it, it's a science course. Of course, they want you to have other skills as well and they'll determine those in different ways. But the academic background, it's very important. You're strong in science areas, particularly chemistry. That's their number one subject. Chemistry, they also like you to do biology as you can imagine for obvious reasons. And as your third A level, perhaps maths, that's an example I've given. You might instead decide to do physics. Um, some of the students may decide psychology, but I would strongly advise it's three science or at least two science and maths. That's a good combination for you to try, for you to study. Um, we can give individual advice about other subject combinations, but if it were me and you were saying to me, you didn't want to study chemistry because you don't like it, I would say, think very hard about whether you want to be a doctor because chemistry is a science. The medical training has a huge component of scientific training. If you don't like chemistry, you may not really like the medical training. So it's worth reflecting on your choices if you don't like the standard science and maths options. Okay, A-level is a two-year course. That's standard in the UK. Um, in our colleges, because we've, we've built them to help international students, um, we also offer a course in January. So uh, in Abbey Cambridge, we've been offering this course for 22 years now. So you can come in January uh, to do a slightly shortened version of an A-level course. We call it 18 months. So work is a little quicker at the start, um, but our students um, tend to be equally successful. Uh, this year, because of the, the various lockdowns across the world in education, we are saying to students, if you would like to join us in September, we anticipate we will all be open. Uh, you may know schools are about to restart in a phased way uh, in three weeks, two and a half weeks. On the 1st of June, primary schools will open and we'll start to see high schools in a phased way opening in June and July, we think. By September, we think life will have returned to normal with lots of safety measures, of course, as, as, as you'd expect, hygiene measures. So we're offering the usual courses. However, um, we're also offering a full range in January. So for students who are a bit worried, perhaps I'll delay, that's fine. You can start in January on our courses. We'd, we'd love to help you. Okay, go back to A-level. All medical schools in the UK accept A-level. Simple as that. So it's a good course for you to study if you are looking for perhaps Bristol University or Nottingham or Edinburgh, Imperial Cambridge, perhaps full spectrum of universities will accept you for A level. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass you over to my esteemed colleague, um, Liz Elam, who is in Manchester, who's going to talk you through the foundation courses. Now, Liz, if you unmute yourself. 
and say hello. You may appear on the screen. Hello. Hello, we can hear you and see you. Brilliant. Okay, Liz, over to you. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. And it's really lovely to be able to talk to everybody today uh, from here in Manchester. Um, so, um, as uh, Julian has been saying, medicine is, is a highly competitive course to get into. So what I want to talk to you about today is a, an alternative route to get into medicine, which is our International Foundation Programme Medicine Pathway. As uh, Julian mentioned, we are currently celebrating Abbey College Manchester's 30th anniversary this year. And part of those celebrations revolve around celebrating hundreds of former students who are now doctors, dentists, vets, and other health professionals because they studied at Abbey College Manchester. So as Julian said, our tradition, our heart, our very core started with the whole idea of medicine and getting into those very competitive courses. Now, as Julian said, it is not easy to get into medicine. It requires a whole range of different criteria to be um, achieved. And I'm going to talk to you about perhaps an alternative route to A-level, which is a lower risk route into selected medical schools for some international students. And that's why um, I'm going to talk now about the structure, the universities, some of the advantages and disadvantages of the programme and the entry criteria. So first of all, I'll move on to the structure of the programme. Now, the International Foundation Medicine Pathway is, um, covers, as Julian said, the core science subjects. So you're looking at biology, chemistry, and then mathematics or physics. And those are the only subjects that can be studied within the International Foundation Medicine Pathway. Unlike A-level, this is a modular program. So you will see it talks about three units of biology, three units of chemistry, and two units of mathematics or physics. And that is so that the exams can be taken in December, March, and June, and there are some resets. Now this again helps to reduce the risk because you are not taking all the exams at the end of the course you are able to take them as the course progresses. Now, this is particularly um, beneficial for international students because you are probably not studying in your native language, which means that you're developing those skills alongside your academic skills. And so, as part of the programme, we offer IELTS lessons uh, which support language, uh, reading, writing, listening, speaking. And we can focus on the elements that are required in order to get you to the right level for the medical application. Now, the other thing about this program is that it is actually um, a percentage score. So unlike A-levels, which are graded A star, A, B, C, D, E, the International Foundation program is a percentage score. So each unit is out of 100% and the whole program is out of 100%. And typically you're going to be requiring 70 to 75% in the programme to be eligible to look at medical school. Now, I just want to emphasise that this pathway is for medicine only, not for dentistry. But you can apply with this pathway to other universities. So let's have a look at the universities that you can apply to. Okay. So we have at the moment three universities that accept the medicine pathway. Now, the first university on the list is Aston University, and that is in Birmingham, which is one of the largest cities in the UK. This is probably the most difficult of the three universities to get into because not only do they require 75%, they also require the UCAT test to be taken. So the UCAT test is a cognitive test which has to be done online uh, before uh, the application goes in. And you have to apply by the 15th of October deadline to, in order to apply to Aston. They've recently brought their IELTS requirement down to 7.0 in all elements, which is good news, which makes it slightly less daunting. They will want to interview using a, a system called MMIs, multi-mini interviews. Uh, this will be explained a little bit later, but that's the sort of rigorous way of undertaking interviews. 
I imagine there may be modifications to this as we move forward um, with the reopening of schools and universities and social distancing. The second university that accepts the medicine pathway is UCLan, the University of Central Lancashire. That is based in Preston, which is a, a city about 40 minutes north of Manchester. The percentage requirement here is 70%, but again, you need 70% overall in biology and chemistry. There's no UCAT test, and you can apply up to May for tier four students, uh, or you can, and via UCAS. So you do not have to um, uh, reach the 15th October deadline if you're on a tier four visa. If you're an EU student, then you must apply by 15th of October. Again, they want 7.0 in IELTS and in all elements, and they interview via the multi-mini interviews, MMIs. The third university that accepts the programme is St George's University, Grenada. Now, this university is actually separated between a city in the north of England called Newcastle and the uh, Caribbean island of Grenada. And on this programme, you require 75%. And again, you must get 70% in biology and chemistry. There's no UCAT. And the most uh, flexible thing about this program is you can apply right up until August of the year before you want to join. So you've got the whole of the academic year to apply for St. George's. And the other thing about St. George's is, although they want 7.0 overall, they do have a minimum of 6.5 in any element, which gives a little bit of flexibility. Then you to get in uh, and you would have an interview with a graduate doctor, so a slightly different process. They also have two foundation years prior to their main degree programme, so if you do not meet the requirement, you may be offered one of those other years. Okay, so let's have a look now at the advantages and disadvantages of the International Foundation Medicine programme. First, I suppose I might look at the disadvantages. The main disadvantages are that it is only accepted in the UK in the main. So that means that if you want to study in another country, you would have to look at that particular university and see whether they would accept the programme. Now, I have had students go to other universities in other countries using the programme, so it is very much on a case by case basis. The other obvious disadvantage is that we have three just three universities that accept for medicine. However, you can apply on the advantage side for almost any other courses that are medically related in the UK with this programme. Now, as Julian said, it's very difficult to get into medicine. Any prospective medic needs a backup plan. You need an alternative course, be it biomedical sciences, pharmacy, neurosciences. There's a whole range you could apply for in order to have a backup in case you do not get into medicine or you do not get into medicine at this stage. The other major advantages of this program are that you can lead it on from any previous year of level three study. So if you've done a year of level three study in your home country, you can go straight into this program as a one year course. If you have done the first year of A-level and you are not on target to get A's and A-stars, then it's a perfect vehicle to jump into this programme to reduce the risk of taking A-level. Because remember, you are scored on your achievement in this programme. You get 70 or 75%. You're not competing against other students to get the high grades. The other major factors about this programme are that it's very accessible and it has built in support for language. So it is, helps to support international students whose first language is not English. We also have an exceptionally comprehensive preparation programme that runs alongside this. And you will learn about medical ethics, about different health systems. You will do practice MMIs. You will learn about medicines, diseases, society. All of these things that are at the forefront of our mind at the moment. And this preparation will help you with interview. It will help you understand the qualities that are required to be a doctor. That's a very important part of the programme. So finally, let's take a look at the entrance criteria for the medicine IFP pathway. So first of all, you must be 17 on the 31st of August of the year of entry. So should you want to start this September, you need to be 17 by the 31st of August. 
And that's because medical schools in the main require students to be 18 when they start their studies. Not the same in all cases, but in general terms, you need to be 18 to then start on a medical degree. You need to have GCSE or a high school equivalent with good grades in the sciences. You should have undertaken one year of level three study in sciences, be that study in your own country, be that AS level, be that the year one of our English, uh, uh, the UK A levels, but you must have that one year already under your belt, so to speak. Ideally, you need an IELTS of 6.5 with no element less than six for entry, although we will look on a case by case basis if you have slipped in one element. You must be willing to undertake relevant voluntary experience and research into the health sector. And Julian will advise on that more in a moment. And as I said, we can look at individual cases as required. So in summary, the International Foundation Medicine Programme is a lower risk route for international students into medicine. It has three universities that will accept for medicine. And you are not competing in A-level grades with other students. So I'm going to pass back to Julian now to continue talking about the routes into medical school. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks very much, Liz. OK, so we've taken you through the career structure to get you through from pre-university to university and the foundation stages. We've also told you the two routes. So the route via A-level, which is, if you like, the traditional route that students in the UK do and, and, and a lot of students overseas join us for, and the foundation route. So those are the routes that, to get you to um, the academic qualification, if you like, to get into medical school. Let's look at Abbey College, Cambridge, Manchester and DLD specifically. How do we help students? So what are the features of our schools? Because as I've mentioned, we are all specialists at helping international students go to university. More than that, we're specialists from a, for a long time standing in helping students get to medical school, which is one of the most difficult um, uh, undergraduate courses to gain entry for. So here are some features about our three colleges. I think it's important to appreciate that we are we have this specialism. It's an important idea. That means when we come to school, we're coming to school with uh, international students in mind. So in my school, for example, almost all the students there are international. In Liz's school, it's about 60% of the students. And in the London school, it's about 80%. So it's in our mind, we're coming to help students who are a long way from home, maybe in a second language, who perhaps when they first join us are a bit nervous about being in a foreign country in a foreign culture. So when we come into school, we know that's our challenge. How do we help international students settle? How do we help them feel confident in a new culture? How do we make it easy to make the transition into studying in the UK? And the way we do that is by, by having that in our minds, by building our, our courses to help people like, uh, people like you. So from my perspective, what it means for my teachers is they choose to work in my school because they want to work with international students. And it's the same for the Manchester School and in, um, in DLD in London. That's quite important. In other words, international students are not simply added in to the classes. That is our central purpose. So the teachers that want to come and work for me want to work with international students and we carry on training each other to help international students. So in my school, for example, every Wednesday afternoon is training. And about every other training session is about the needs of international students. How do we help develop language? How do we help develop IELTS 6.5 to IELTS 7.5 in writing, in a maths lesson, or a biology lesson, or a physics lesson? So we're all working together. We keep our class size quite small. So we have very small classes which gives you the advantage of having a lot of the teachers uh, attention when they're marking your homework. If you're with only six other students, that teacher will remember exactly what you did right and what you did wrong and will give you explicit feedback to help you improve. We're an international community and we find that children that join our three colleges do so because they are they have a drive and ambition. And I, I think as a prospective medical student, you probably have as much drive as anybody 
So you'll be coming to a school with people like you who are looking to gain entry to a tough course at a top university. There's also a lot of innovation in our school. So we reflect what is the best course to offer. So in Manchester, Liz created this unique course where you study your academic courses alongside professional football training. We've developed these foundation courses and the outcomes in the schools are very, very strong. So though you can see for Abbey Cambridge, our pass rate for A-level is uh, fantastic. 71%, it's extremely high. The average in the UK is 26. So the outcomes here are very, very strong. So that's, if you like, the headlines of what we do to help students get to medical school. Right, let's have a little look at the detail. So particularly for medical schools, I don't think it's enough to go simply to a good school and have a good A-level or foundation preparation. That's fine for other courses. Frankly, if you studied your A-levels in my school for biology, chemistry and maths, if you wanted to be a scientist, that's probably the most important training you can do is your A-levels. If you want to be a doctor, that's just part of it. There are three requirements. We've talked about the academics, your A-levels, the foundation course. We've talked about English, academic English, that the bar is higher for doctors. So in all three of our colleges, we will train you on English, the right level for you. And you'll probably find, by the way, it's your writing that needs most work. We know this because we're specialists in helping international students. The third component, academic, English, writing, uh, English writing, the third component is simply being a doctor. Now, that sounds a bit silly because you're not a doctor yet. But what I mean is the third component to get to medical school is being a doctor in here. You have to become a doctor in your mind. You have to think like a doctor so that when you apply to university, you're applying as a doctor. OK, you haven't been trained yet. You're not a qualified doctor, but you're a doctor. You're ready. You think like a doctor. You see the world like a doctor. How do you get to that point? Well, that's the, what we call the million dollar question. How do you get to the point where you are, in your mind, a doctor without the training yet? Well, we choose to do this in our three colleges by giving you preparation courses at the beginning. So the minute you arrive, we're thinking, hmm, how can we, what can we do to help you start to think about medicine? In fact, we'd like you to start thinking now. I'll, I'll talk a bit about this towards the end of, of the talk, about what you can do right now to start becoming a doctor in your mind. OK, so there are medical preparation courses. As an example, in my school, in the first term of your A-level course, for example, in, in year 12, we have a medic club. We have a director of studies who will be looking at uh, individual counselling for you about work experience. In the second term, the medic club is joined by another session in the week called our pre-degree diploma. So that's, that's how we provide our medicine courses, but it's a very similar approach in all of our three courses. In other words, we know it is not enough for you to just do academic and English. You must have this third component where you become a doctor. Okay. The preparation courses we do encompass everything we think you need to become a doctor and be successful in gaining entry to medical school. So you can see it's things like work experience. So we have many contacts in, uh, in, in our three cities where we can help you find work experience. We know the sorts of things that you need to do to read because it's very daunting if I said to you, go and read about medicine. You think, well, what, what do I read? How do I start that? Because unless you're a medical expert, it's quite difficult to know what to do, where to start reading. Well, we know, we know what you need to do to start reading. We know the sources of information. We know the kinds of books you need to read and we know how daunting it is. So we chop it up, make it simple for you at the start. And we ask you then to come and talk to us about what you've read. So you're explaining your thinking about the book that you've read or the chapter you've read. As time goes on in our course, you will be encouraged to do a project. And that's something you do in the first year. And you can see the, the, the young student there in, on your screen is presenting. She's presenting her project to the school. Well, that's what a doctor would do. So she's already becoming a doctor, you can see, by presenting to the whole school. As the course progresses, we also start giving individual advice about your application, your personal statement, help on entry tests and help with interviews. 
Okay, let's look at this in a bit more detail, just to spell it out to you. So you can see there, we all in our three colleges will help you with work experience. Now, work experience is essential. If you haven't got some now, start to think how you can get some. It's going to be difficult at this point in many countries because of the coronavirus pandemic. Work experience is not something hospitals are focusing on right now because they have other challenges. But it will pass and work experience will start to become available again. There are other means of getting work experience. Um, for example, there's a university in the UK that does a virtual work experience, um, Brighton University, for example. Um, you can also do voluntary work. Now, the importance of this cannot be understated. If you're going to become a doctor without the training, you need to speak to other doctors. You need to see what they do. You need to actually go and be with healthcare professionals. Spend some time with the nurses to find out what, what exactly do nurses do? How do nurses think? What are their concerns right now? What, what actually that happens in a ward in a, in a hospital? Or what, what is general practice? What happens there? What do the receptionists do? How, what, what kind of experience is there for a, for a general practitioner? If you don't see it yourself, then you're really using secondhand information. You're thinking to yourself, well, I, I read, this is what this person says, I'm sure it's true. Well, you have to see it for yourself. Okay, as I said, it's, it's going to be difficult at the moment, but there are means to do this, virtual work experience, for example. But for us, assuming all things are back to normal, this will be part of what we do. We will help you arrange work experience and get voluntary work. Um, from the moment you arrive, that process will start to wind up one-to-one -one consultation, in my case, from the Director of Studies. Um, we found, for example, in Cambridge, that our local teaching hospital, which is used by the University of Cambridge, will give us places every year. So we have allocated places from that hospital. We also have allocated places in other hospitals in surrounding towns and cities. Okay. Now, um, this preparation, work experience is important. We are then going to help you with entrance exams. So entrance exams um, are the things you have to do beyond a level and foundational so unfortunately for medicine because it is so competitive uh, universities will ask you to sit something called bmat or ucat now you may have some familiarity with those terms they are um in in some cases they are uh, science exams so they're asking you quick if you like multiple choice questions about science at the level just before a level so in this country gcse so the kind of science you do at age 16 but they're quite tricky questions they also uh, the bmat will ask you to write a, a short essay a one page essay so can you imagine you have to be very precise and ordered and logical in a one page essay you, there's no there's no time for waffling um, and also the questions are critical thinking based you have to analyze situations and that's more about the, the UCAT. This is not something you can train for in a day or a week. You need a long time to train for that. So we will start that preparation for you in January for the exams that happen perhaps in August, November, uh, August, September, October, November. So we have a long run in of preparing you how to sit those examinations, the BMAT and the UCAT. Then we're looking at how to prepare you for personal statements. So personal statements is you writing about why you want to be a doctor, why you are a doctor. And that is probably the key document. So the personal statement, you have to write evidence as to why you're a doctor. And that's the key, evidence. You can't simply say, I've always dreamed of being a doctor. Since I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a doctor. I want to help people. That's true but it's not going to get you into medical school. What you need to say is, I want to be a doctor. Here are six pieces of evidence as to why I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor. I think and I see like, I, I like a doctor. For example, here's the first piece of evidence. Um, I understand the tremendous challenges doctors face because when I saw um, a, a consultant uh, um, in a hospital doing their rounds, I uh, saw the demands, the information coming from different directions from the 
uh, patient's record from uh, the, the senior nurse, from the junior doctors, and that consultant had to take that information and process it very quickly and make a judgment. I can do that because I've done the same thing when I perhaps took part in a debate or I did some research. So personal statements, this is the skill of it and will guide you through it. It's a series of pieces of evidence. Most people don't see it that way. Most people don't realize that actually there's a very simple approach to this. This is the evidence I, I can give you that I'm a doctor. These are the insights I've gained through my experiences, through the things I've read, through the, um, the doctors I've spoken to. This also then leads us on to interview training. You will, in all likelihood, be interviewed. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, there are, oops, I've just passed on one too many, sorry. Um, interviews um, are likely to take place at the December to January, February, March time of your second year of A-level or in the middle of your foundation course, for your one year foundation course. Why do they interview you? Well, because they want to see if you have the personal qualities that would make a good doctor. So obviously they would know about your academic qualities because of your A-level and what your school has written about you in the, in the application form. They'll know that you have an interest because you've got a good personal statement. If you didn't, they would reject you. If they're interested in you, they will like to see you face to face. Now, there are two approaches here for interview, and we will train you on both approaches. The first approach for interview is what is now called traditional. In other words, it's a process that's been used for many, many decades. And the traditional interview is typically, you're invited into a room, you sit on a chair, there's a table, and behind it are three people, perhaps four, maybe five. Those three people perhaps will include a consultant that works in the hospital linked to the university you've applied to. It might be one of the admissions department, and it might be a third year medical student. There might be a work experience uh, person there, perhaps, unlikely. Um, so you're gonna be facing three trained people, perhaps a, like I say, a medical student who partway through training, a senior consultant and an admissions person. They will ask you a series of questions. So it's an interview. It's a job interview, actually. That's what it really is. So, of course, you'll be, you'll be dressed smartly, professionally, and you will be expected to ask the two answer questions ranging from simple but very hard questions like why do you want to be a doctor to what qualities do you think you can bring? How would you help somebody in this situation? You know, a friend of yours who's uh, too nervous to sit exams. How would you confide in your seniors about a potential problem you've noticed. So lots of different scenarios will be presented to you in this kind of interview. The alternative interview is what Liz mentioned earlier, MMI. This is a, a newer approach, multiple mini interviews. So in this case, you don't go into one room and sit down behind a table with three or four interviewers. You go into several rooms and there'll be stations there. And in one station, it might be there's a scenario and you have to give your answer, give your response to a scenario. It might be an ethical scenario. So you have a, a difficult situation in a medical context. How would you respond to that? There will be somebody in the back of the room with a clipboard writing down observations and scoring your response. You might go to the next room with other applicants and you have a team activity. How do you work together as a team? There are various things that we can do to prepare you for that, because you may say, well, I could work in a team easy, but actually there are certain approaches to teamwork that you, you, you will benefit from being trained on. So what I do is I observe teamwork in my school for medic students, and then I give feedback and I show you how each member is behaving and how you're seen as a team worker. So, in multiple million interviews, you might go to the next room and there could be an actor pretending to be a patient. You then have to talk to the patient. So it's a role play exercise. So you can see MMI, it's very demanding. Lots of different aspects of being a doctor and each station you're being observed. So that takes a lot of preparation. As an example, um, in our school in Cambridge, what we have been doing from January to uh, March, one of the strands of work I've been talking about ethical uh, dilemmas. 
how to answer ethical problems for MMI. A colleague of mine has been looking at how to talk about work experience. Another colleague has been looking at uh, UCAT exams. And a third colleague, has, a fourth colleague, has been looking at the NHS structure. So you can see parallel pieces of work for all our medical students. OK. Just to carry on, I'll show you one extra little feature. Um, in my school, because we are a boarding school, you, you, you might choose to live with us. As you can see, uh, we, have, we have a boarding house behind us. We have four boarding houses. So we have the opportunity for evening work. So there are occasions where we bring doctors in in the evening. We might do medical projects in the evening. Our psychology teacher but perhaps will give you a psychology workshop in the evening. We call it Abbey Inspire. So it's just an additional way for you to develop your thinking the way that a doctor would. Okay. Good, so we're getting towards the end of the talk. So I hope you've, you've got a good understanding now of, of the, the career route, the training route, the two different ways to get to medical school, A-level, IFP, and the features that Abbey Colleges and DLD will help you with, the, the training we will go through to get you ready to think like a doctor for when your application goes through and when you have your interview. What can you do now? Well, if you are, uh, a year 11 student, perhaps, uh, or even a year 12, if you're thinking about your application in a year or perhaps even this year, you, you should start now. And it's very simple. I think you should be, you should be reading, looking, observing and thinking. OK, so what sort of things can you read? Well, once you join a school like Abbey Cambridge, we will guide your reading. Um, but for example, there's lots of information on web websites. So in the UK, we would advise UK websites so that you're finding out uh, the, you're finding the UK perspective on health. In, for example, the BBC, I'm sure you've heard of, they have a very, very good website about health. Um, there are other newspapers that are, um, that have got very good, very, that have got very good journalists such as The Guardian or The Daily Telegraph. There's also a very good website for the National Health Service, the NHS. Um, and that will give you a huge amount of information. So you could spend days on that website alone, developing your knowledge. Start now. You can also read books. For example, there's a, a fashion right now for books written by junior doctors. That, that, in other words, doctors in those foundation years, F1, F2, and perhaps training in their GP training or consultant training sessions. And those doctors are telling you what it's actually like. How, what's the job really like? Hard. Let me explain how it's hard. So they're like diaries of junior doctors, but very powerful because you then think, oh, OK, when I do my work experience, I'll, I'll look out for that. I'll think about that. And then books of general medical interest. Again, we have reading lists for this sort of thing. The next thing I would try and do is if you can observe. Now, it may not be possible because of the current lockdown for you to have work experience, but you can see the statements here of what the purpose of work experience is. People-focused experience of people providing care or help to others. So care is the word there. What is it like to be in a profession where you look after other people? You have to see that. Now, that could be a care home. Um, it could be uh, a school, for example, a primary school, perhaps for children with, with disabilities and special needs. Um, might be a hospital. Um, so that's something that's very important for you to see and, and then think, what, what is it like? Can I, can I do this? And, and, and ultimately, volunteer and, and do work in a care environment. Okay. Um, you can also then start to develop some of the values and attitudes because you're seeing okay, um, the way that professionals uh, uh, behave and hopefully then get an, a realistic understanding, a mature view you'll become like a doctor. All right, the last piece of advice I would say to you right now is keep a diary. Reflect about what you're seeing, what you're reading and write it down, otherwise you may forget. Okay, good, right. Well, um, we've, we're reaching the end of this talk. Um, thank you for your patience. I hope it's been of interest to you. I thought we'd end by just saying, well, look, um, this is all very well, all this talk, what really has happened. So I thought I'd show you last year, 2019, uh, these are the students from my school in Cambridge that have now gone to medical school. Um, you can see there's a fantastic range of universities. Aston, uh, Liz has mentioned, that's through a foundation programme. Um, we also have going to university. 
in other countries, such as Poland, mm -hmm. uh, Malaysia, but oh, also Cambridge University as well. Um, so you've got a, a really good, strong list of universities uh, for Abbey College Cambridge last year, um, and also the most recent the College Manchester. Again, you can see uh, many fantastic universities the students have gone to. So 19 medical students in the last entry, which was in September last year. Fantastic. Well, look, we've, we've come to the end of our talk. Um, I hope it's been of help to you and it's uh, provided you a bit of uh, thinking for you to do about your, your career and shows you the kind of support that we're very happy to provide for you if you were to come and join one of our three colleges. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, we, I, I believe if John is with us, John, do we have any questions that uh, we may be able to help with? Hi Julian, yes, we've got a few questions um, and hopefully I've, I've kind of gathered everyone's questions together, but um, if there are questions that come up while, while we're discussing this, feel, feel free to still post them in the chat. Um, but what I think I'll do, because we've got a few, I'll, I'll sort of um, hit you with them in doubles, um, so you, yourself and Liz can, can maybe answer them. The first couple were, um, if a student has an, an A-star IGCSE English, um, does that mean that they don't have to sit the IELTS? Um, I think that's referring to IELTS in terms of progression to medical school. And then the, the second question, just to follow up on that, um, we were asked if there is a significant difference between the medical programmes that are offered at different UK universities. Okay, um, if it's first language, you'll be fine with A-star. Um, with GCSE, the, the advice I would give you is look on the university's website because the universities give slightly different requirements and it's different between first and second language GCSE. So please look on the website. This is part of what we would do uh, with a student here. We would be checking their academic backgrounds, cross-referencing to universities, which as a general rule, first language uh, IGCSE, ASTAR would be fantastic. Um, second question, are there differences uh, between medical schools? Yes, of course, there are differences in philosophies, in differences in approach, and that is revealed by, at the very beginning, some universities will offer, um, will ask you to sit BMAT, some will ask you to sit UCAT. They're different, slightly different kinds of exams reflecting different philosophies by those universities. Some universities will ask you to sit a traditional interview, some will be MMI. So you can see they, they do have different ways of seeing things. When you start at Cambridge University, for example, you don't see patients for three years. Wow, that's because at Cambridge University, their philosophy is you should learn science first. You should learn the science of medicine before you're allowed to go near patients. Whereas if you go to another university, Nottingham, for example, they'd like you to see patients because their philosophy is Medicine is about patient interaction and science. So let's do both of those to give us longer to develop your soft skills, your interactive skills. So yes, there are differences. How do you find out what the differences are? Look carefully at the university websites or speak to somebody in one of our colleges who's an expert in these things. We have many staff who could help you. There's a huge amount of knowledge one acquires when you're a specialist in medicine. Um, but I would say, don't be too distracted by different approaches across different universities. Your aim is to get into university to study medicine. That is a big enough challenge to get into a university because most students that apply don't get in. The, ma the minority get in, the majority don't. That's because of the competition. So don't be too worried. Find universities you think you fit the profile off, you like their approach to education, you would prefer perhaps to see patients at the start, for example, but don't worry too much because you're not choosing, the university is choosing, they are selecting who they choose. So build up your strong application, find four universities, for example, in UCAS, but don't spend too long thinking, well, which, which is better? Your, your priority is getting yourself to be the strongest candidate. John. Thanks, Julian. Um, just, just a couple more that I'm going to bundle together. Um, one of the agents asked um, if 
um, if, if we have students progressing to dentistry or if we've ever had students progressing to dentistry uh, from, from our programs and, and if so is, is the preparation that we do is it different um, and then there were a couple of questions just around the IFP um, we were asked um, if you can apply to different universities um, from the from the medicine IFP from from the ones that we mentioned um, and also we were asked if the St George's Grenada course was recognized as a UK degree so I'll just put those ones to you guys Liz. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, John. Okay, so just following on from Julian's point about the difficulty of getting into medicine, only 7% of applicants get into medicine each academic year. So you've got to put that into perspective. And when you look at the large numbers that we've got into medicine over the last few years, you can see that the percentage chance of getting into medicine is increased if you come to one of our colleges. Now, in terms of dentistry, um, you can, you get in, in Abbey College Manchester, and I'm sure in Cambridge, we get, give the dentist the same preparation, although there are some slight differences to it, slight nuances of difference, because obviously for dental students, there are other aspects that need to be considered uh, in terms of being um, sort of dexterous and so on and so forth. But yes, dentists do. I think I said before that A-levels are the only route into dentistry. You cannot do the foundation medicine programme for dentistry. Now, as far as it goes with other universities, at the current moment, Aston and UCLan and St George's are the three that are, are accepted, uh, that accept the International Foundation Medicine programme. There may be others that will join, um, but there's nothing else official at the moment. In terms of St George's, now that's a very good question because St George's, you can actually in the end uh, qualify to practice in either the UK or the United States. So actually that particular pathway gives you other options. You can do your uh, medical practice either here in the UK or you can do those years in the States and then qualify for either you would then need to take the exam in order to qualify for being a practicing doctor in the United States, but everyone would need to do that anyway. So that does give you extra options. And I'd just like to mention as well, that uh, in terms of the number of students we've got at the moment on the pathway, we've got um, about 10 students on the Medicine Pathway Foundation. Two have got offers from St. George's, one has got an offer from Aston and two have got offers from UCLan and there are still delays to the interviews at UCLan at the moment. So as you can see, as a proportion of the students compared to the 7% I mentioned earlier, in terms of the offers, they've got a very, very good rate of getting an offer. And I just thought I'd reiterate that to you. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, there were just a, a couple of questions that came off the back of that, actually, uh, that have popped up. Um, one was, is, is the 7% progression, does that count for both um, domestic, so British and international students, or is that more focused towards international students? Uh, and the other, the other question was just kind of, from the Medicine uh, Foundation, um, if students achieve, you know, the, the, the qualifying scores, do they get a guaranteed place, or is it more a case that they get an offer with, with, with the offer of an interview? Okay, so in terms of the 7%, that is across all applicants. I think each medical school has its own cap on international students. Uh, and again, that's where Aston and UCLan do have a slightly higher proportion, particularly UCLan for international students. So that is a, a positive there. And as Julian said, it's very important that you research your universities carefully. But in the end, what you need to look at, what is the least lesser line of resistance for getting into a particular university for you as an individual applicant? Because actually, you need to look at the number of places they've got available and so on and so forth. And at interview, you would be expected to have researched the university and know what they do and be up to speed with how they deliver their course to show that you've really understood and done your research. But I want to reiterate what Julian said, that you really need to look at where am I more likely to be able to get into because a medical degree is a medical degree. So that's really the kind of important piece. Now, in terms of um, getting a guarantee, once you have had an interview and you have got an offer if you meet the requirements of the offer then you will get into the university there are no guaranteed progressions at this stage with any of these universities you do not get get, get guaranteed progression into medical school um, you know that does not happen 
Okay, thank thank you, Liz. Um, just just a couple more questions that have come up. Um, just one was um, around the kind of how internships are built into medical degrees. So do all do all of the, the the medicine undergraduate courses do they have the internships built into them? And then also we had a question just saying, do universities set minimum BMAT scores um, and uh, for for progression? And 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 if so, do we know what those are? And uh, a couple of the the universities that were referenced were Oxford and UCL. Um, so is that something we know? Is that something that changes um, year on year, or do we not know from the universities? Hi, John. Um, sorry, what was the first one again? Sorry, I'll unmute myself. So the first one was just um, how is the 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 work experience or the internships? How is that yeah. built into the sure. medical programs? Okay, good. So um, if you get to a university for a medical course, um, everything you do is included in that course. So it's, if you like, it's built in. So the example for Cambridge University is you spend three years in academic study and then you spend time at the local hospital, Addenbrooke's, for your clinical training. Other universities, the clinical training runs alongside. Um, so it's part of it. If you're thinking about the foundation year afterwards, once you qualify with your undergraduate uh, study, um, then you will, you basically apply for foundation training across the country and you'll be accepted by probably several of them um, to, to, to start your foundation training. The idea is that you go to different geographical locations in the UK, so you see different parts of the UK, and you go to different kinds of hospitals and you see different sorts of specialism to build up your foundation F1 and F2 studies. So it's not a case of them being internships, it's employment and it's the standard route through for all medical doctors. In the UK, as I've said, we are short of doctors, and so we positively encourage students after their undergraduate studies to stay with us for the foundation year, which is why the tier four route goes through. You don't have to apply for a work visa. You're still on your student visa for two years, and you are paid. So it's kind of part of it. BMAT scores, UCAT scores change. Um, but the best advice I can give actually is, is perhaps um, either look on, on the website, it is in there, the entry requirements, um, or perhaps if you want to um, pass on specific questions uh, to myself or John or Liz, and we can pass it on to our directors of studies who have this information for this year at their fingertips. Um, clearly, a university like Oxford, they take the very best students in the world. So they are going to look at a very, very high score. Um, UCL is also a, considered to be a, one of the top five universities in the UK and for medicine particularly hard to gain entry for actually um, for UCL, Imperial, Cambridge and Oxford. Um, so th there will be high scores so there's absolutely no doubt about that and by the way just just to give you a bit of an insight for BMAT and UCAT those papers are designed so that you cannot prepare students for it. That's what they say. They don't want you to coach students to these exams. That's entirely not the point. The point is to find students, if you like, their native ability. How, how do they solve problems? Now, of course, we know you can train for these exams and we can sensitize the students. So that's a key part of the run through in year 12 to give our students a very strong chance of gaining entry when they uh, um, sit those, those BMAT and UCAT. Thanks, Julian. Um, just a couple of questions that I think are kind of interwoven, and I think this is for Julian. Um, Susan asked, um, can you give a bit more background on um, the Taiwanese student, Jackie, who, who got into Cambridge for medicine? And then there's another question, which I think <coughs> kind of piggybacks that a little bit, where um, someone's asked, what are the best grades that students should be aiming for, I, I guess, at A-level, uh, if they're targeting medicine? Okay, yes. I'll do the first one first, the best grades. Well, let's rewind. Um, the, the competition for medical schools is enormous. Liz mentioned 7%. It's actually quite variable depending on the university. Um, so you've got to think, how am I going to beat the competition? Well, you're not going to beat them with B grades. Forget it. Somebody else will have A grades. They'll get taken. It's a competition. It's an inevitable result of an oversubscribed marketplace. Um, typically, for students that progress through with good grades, it's about 40% once they get through the various criteria. So, so of the full pool, about 7% gain entry. Once you get over the, hot, the, the hurdles of academic results, and once you get towards the process of being selected, when you get to your personal statement, it's about 40% gain entry there. How do you get into that pool of 
by having the absolute best grades you can. So if you have a student who has B grades at GCSE, the universities will look at those and they'll go, well, you're not going to be the best doctor, are you, if you've got B grades, because I've got another applicant here and he's got A grades. So we probably aren't going to waste our time taking your application any further, unfortunately. It's the most competitive degree in the UK. So they are looking for, well, the, the top students. Frankly, I think I want my doctor to be an A grade student, not a B grade student. Actually, I'd ask, why not? Why are you not an A grade student? So yes, um, you have to assume everything should be an A. Now, in the real world, not everything is always going to be an A or an A star, but that's the kind of territory we need to be in. So if you have a student who's getting Bs and Cs, it's going to be a really tough call because the university will think, well, I've got a thousand applications, 20% of them haven't got A's. Let's not take them any further. Let's deal with the others. So we will help students on that journey if they're not hitting A grades consistently and our measures are not helping them get up to A grades, there are alternative routes through. You know, there, there are alternative degrees such as pharmacy, for example, or biosciences. Um, the student from, <coughs> excuse me, from Taiwan who uh, is now studying at Cambridge University, Jackie. Um, Jackie was extremely strong academically. He was an A star student in four subjects. Now, in, in my school, I'm very fortunate. We, we have quite a number of students who are of that category. He was not the only A star medic student we had last year in Abbey College, Cambridge. I had about four who were equally strong. What separated Jackie apart? He was a Cambridge doctor. Now, what does that mean? A Cambridge doctor is perhaps a more academically oriented doctor. In other words, maybe more intellectual, you might say, uh, more interested in the academic nature of illness. He was strong with interpersonal skills, otherwise he wouldn't have got in. In other words, he could sit with me. We did many, many mock interviews, Jackie and I, as, as I tend to do for all of our students for medicine. He was able to sit there very maturely and you could see, yeah, I'm a doctor. And he was talking to me like a doctor does. But his, his heart, his love came back to the academic side of things. He'd, he'd puzzle over why a cancer was caused and how it spread, perhaps at a cellular level. He's thinking, what, what's going on when a patient has a metastasizing cancer. What's the biology of that? So he was perhaps a little more intellectually curious about the science. That's what I think got him through at Cambridge. Um, I had other students that applied to Cambridge last year who actually didn't get offers, who got offers for other universities, who were equally strong, I felt, but just didn't quite have that perspective that I think Cambridge want. Um, let's not forget Cambridge University is usually the first or second university always in the UK so they are looking for the very very best students so in short he was a star he was serious with intent he listened he did the research that we asked him to do he did all that work but he had this sense perhaps of being a bit more deeply interested in what's behind the science of medicine so I hope that gives you a bit of an insight to a, a strong Cambridge uh, applicant John Thank you, Julian. Um, I think I think we've just got a couple more questions, then then we'll call that it. So I'll, I'll put the last couple of questions that we've got through. Um, someone has asked: um, Is ranking important in terms of the medical schools? Um, in, in terms of the ones you choose uh, to becoming a doctor? And then um, the final question I think um, is: Is someone's asked? There is quite a lot of choice of colleges that offer progression to medicine, focus on STEM, or even are kind of based um, or, or, or partnered with universities. Um, they were just asking, are there, are there things that, that, that students should be looking for? Are there questions that they should be asking when they're selecting between colleges? What sort of things do they need to be aware of? So those are the sure. last couple of questions. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly mention ranking. Um, I don't think ranking is particularly important for medical school applicants. There are exceptional students, the student from Taiwan, Jackie, for example. He got offers from all four universities. He's exceptional. Your main challenge is to get into medical school. So, for example, most medical school have fewer than 100 places for international students. Some of the bigger ones might have 150. That's for students from everywhere outside the EU. 
So competition is severe. So I know rankings are very important to many parents, and rightly so. There is a difference between a university ranked number five in the UK than a university ranked 105 in the UK. There's absolutely no doubt about that. There is a difference. So if you did a law degree in a university ranked five, it's different to a law degree in a university ranked 35 or 65 or 105. That is absolutely true. And the students that go there will be of different ability. So there are advantages when you study law or engineering or science in going to a higher ranked university. Medicine is different because in order to offer a medical course, the university must hit a standard. That's across, that's the same across all medical schools. In other words, you can't offer a medical degree program at a lower level than the British government allows or the Department of Health or the uh, British Medical uh, Association will allow. They set the bar. It's a bit like A-level. Everyone does the same A-level across the country. The standard's the same. Therefore, the standard in medical school is the same. So when you look at a ranking, it might be that one university is lower ranked because its physics department, its law department aren't as strong, but its medical school will be as strong. So once you've qualified as a doctor, whichever university in the UK you've qualified from, you've qualified. So don't worry too much about rankings. Certainly when we consult with our students and we advise them which universities to apply to, we're never, we're never looking at rankings. We're looking at matching the right student with the right university. The exceptions are, of course, people like Jackie, the four A star superstar students. We might say, OK, maybe you should apply to Cambridge and UCL and Imperial. And maybe something slightly out of that elite group like Nottingham University or Birmingham University, still a fantastic university. But ranking, I, I really don't see as, as, as important in the work that I do on medicine. It's more matching and getting into medical school. As to which college you should choose, um, there are indeed colleges um, at sort of at university, so on campus. And we know those courses uh, are available in the market, if you like. Um, I think there's um, something to be said for a, a child who is aged 16 or 17 for still being in, you can see the picture on the screen there, a school-like environment or a college environment. In my experience, those children are not, are not usually ready to be at a university. It's, it's a different world. University is adult education. So my comfort for these children is, is being in a very supportive school. So, for example, in Manchester, there are just over 200 students there. So it's a, it's a wonderful community where people look after each other. They support each other. Um, in, in DLD in London and my school, uh, we're a little bit larger, but we have house systems. So everybody belongs to a house, like in Harry Potter, regardless of your age. So you're looked after. So there's, there's something about the, the right part, the right institution for a teenager to be in. My feeling is at that age, a college environment, moving from high school, between high school and university, perhaps is suitable. I, I think there's a very strong argument for the care and the support, particularly if you're coming to a foreign country for the first time. What I would look for if I was a student choosing a school, I would look for a track record. I would say that's all very well, what you've said, how many students have got to medical school? What is your track record? How long have you been doing this for? What do you know? How will you help me? So I would look for specific advice, um, answers about, um, in this case, a medical program. Um, as it happens, we offer the same degree of support for all of our programs. So I mentioned the support that starts at the beginning for medicine. We actually have parallel support in, in classrooms next door for law and then engineering and um, finance. Um, uh, physics. So this is going on for all of our subjects. So look at track record and look at the meat. What actually will the, 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 the college provide to strengthen the application? Um, the, the, uh, if you like, the, the medical preparation programs. A lot of colleges say they do them and, that, and that's fine. Ask specifically, what, what, how will I be different at the end of doing this medical preparation program? What will I actually do? And um, how, how, what, uh, what support will I get? Who is going to be running the course? So exam for example, in, in my school, um, I have a team of five teachers running the medical preparation course. That's the head of um, biology. I've got uh, two chemistry teachers, 
um, and a biology teacher, I've got a director of studies specialising in, in medicine, and myself. So I actually lead the medical programme and I do the final mock interviews. Um, so look at the detail of the medical preparation programme and look at the track record, I would say. Thank you, Julian. Um, one more question has just come in if we have time. Um, someone, uh, Tati, Tatiana, has asked, if with, with medicine being so competitive a course, um, is there another way into medicine if they don't get in, don't get accepted to medical school the first time? Yes, yes, there is. So, I mean, you know, some students go down retaking their A-levels as a possible route if they've had any exceptional circumstances during their time. That's probably going to be a minimum number of people can do that. Your other option is to take a biomedical sciences degree, for example, and then look at postgraduate entry into medicine. And that will mean that you will miss the first year of the medical course. But just be aware on that route that you will need to get a first or a two one and you need to look carefully at the detail of the universities that have that advertise that kind of programme. Um, again, as Julian's reiterated throughout, it's always really important to go to the university websites, the university admissions and look at each one individually because they are different. And the same applies for dentistry with a postgraduate route. So those are possibilities. Just to continue the theme of the support, um, Afshan Ahmed, Dr. Afshan Ahmed, who is the head of um, Aston Medical School, uh, actually did a seminar with our students on live, a live webinar like this kind of session last week. And I think it's those links with the universities directly, the taste todays, the advice, and so on and so forth that we have with the universities that we have close links with really help in terms of the preparation of the students uh, so that they know what they need to do to be able to be ready to apply and it helps them with that process thank you thank you liz um sorry to just throw one in but i think it's an important question that's come through from marisha she's just asked um and i'll put this to julian or liz um would you would you consider taking a gap year to be a good idea for a student um, who is looking to study medicine well it depends whether you've made your application and you're deferring. It depends whether you want to make a post results application. Now, sometimes students may not be academically uh, ready to make a competitive application by the 15th of October deadline. And sometimes we recommend that students perhaps apply for alternative courses, don't apply for medicine during that academic year, and then do a post results application if they gain the grades. So I think one of the things we have to emphasize is that undertaking all the interviews and the preparation for it is like doing another A-level or another whole strand to your program compared to what anyone else is doing. The amount of time it takes to do all your reading, your research, your preparation, psyching yourself up for interview, all the practice, the same as Julian. We have a team of people, my director of science, my head of biology, uh, my uh, other biology teachers, myself, that are part of that preparation program. So for any student applying for medicine, it does take an awful lot of preparation. Now, if you're a, someone who's academic, you've got the grades, but you're not quite ready, then it might be a good idea to take an, a, a gap year with planned work experience and planned things that are going to help and assist your application if you are academically strong, but weaker in the other areas at that stage. And that can often apply to someone who might decide a bit later in later on that they want to apply for medicine where they hadn't been thinking about it previously. So, you know, that though the, the gap year can have its benefits. So I'm sure Julian might want to add to that. Yeah, hi. Um, for me, a gap year for, for a medical student, I would I would ask why? Why do you want to take a gap year? And what are you going to do? Because it could be extremely powerful if you are doing something that will make you more prepared for medical school or more prepared for the application to medical school. So if you're just going to go on a holiday for a year, it, it's not going to add any value. So medical schools probably wouldn't be that interested in your gap year. But if it's something, something useful, if you're going perhaps to a poorer country, maybe you're spending some time in a country in sub-Saharan Africa to work in a clinic there. Uh, perhaps you're going to a, a rural area in your own country where you can support and that's got value and that will change you. And that's important. Gap years, if they're done well, do change students and they help them take a little step towards 
being, being an adult. Um, and that maturity will help you. So I would say a gap year for a medic student can be really powerful if it is thought through and if it's going to be useful and if you're going to contribute to uh, a situation uh, that, that will benefit from, uh, from uh, an energetic young person. You will be changed by that and you'll probably be a stronger candidate. But like I said, it's, it's not for everybody and it must be thought out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Julian. Thanks, Liz. Um, I think that's kind of all the questions. Um, obviously, we will be we will be in touch. We'll, we'll send you a recording of, of the, the webinar as well. And that will be another opportunity for you guys to ask questions um, if you would like. Um, so I don't know, if Liz or Julian, if you want to say anything just to sign off. But I think that's it for the questions. Just to say thank you very much for listening. We hope it's been informative. It's been really, really interesting, the questions you've asked. And uh, keep safe. And I hope to see some of you soon, uh, students at Abbey Manchester, and work with you. So bye from me. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, from me, thank you very much. Um, I hope that was uh, informative for you. That was our intention, was to, to help you with this uh, uh, challenging process of getting to medical school. And uh, my very best wishes. If you are interested in coming to join us in Cambridge, we'd look forward to seeing you hopefully in September. All the very best. Bye-bye.